go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are your people and the sheep of your pastor. Lord, we are the ones who were redeemed, you were bought, you were, we were paid for by the blood of Christ. And so as we open your word, may our hearts be ready to receive what you have said, what you are saying to us through your word. So Lord, speak to us today as we look to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can open your Bibles up, we are in the book of Ephesians, still. <laughs> we are in the last section, the final greetings. So Ephesians chapter 6, starting in, in verse 21, if you can stand for the reading of the word as I read, follow along. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21 through 24. So that you may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are doing and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. May God bless the reading of his word as we look at it here. Billy Graham once said, the motive of grace is the infinite, compassionate love of a merciful God. But the work of grace was the death of Christ on the cross. A couple weeks ago, when we were actually in D.C., we, we missed it by like a day, there was a bronze sculpture put into the statutory hall of the U.S. Capitol about a week ago, and it was of the prolific evangelist, America's pastor, right, um, Billy Graham. Reverend Franklin Graham, his son, was there, and he said his father would have been more than a little bit uncomfortable with the, all the, the attention that had been there about him because he wanted the focus to be on the one he preached. He wanted the focus to be on the Lord Jesus Christ. And here at the end of the epistle to the Ephesus, we hear the messenger of grace, Paul, send encouragement to remind them of God's grace and peace in Christ himself. And we know this to be the case because Tychicus, who is only mentioned about five times in the New Testament, here is mentioned, and while he was not well known, Outside, you know, everyone knows the Apostle Paul. He was well known to the Apostle Paul and to Ephesus. And so even though he wasn't a somebody, he was a nobody, when the gospel of grace gets a hold of you, then you realize that all of us nobodies know the somebody in Jesus Christ. And we are fully known and fully loved by our amazing God. Just like in the words of Casting Crowns, right? I'm just a nobody, trying to tell everybody, all about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me, you gave me my heart, a song to sing. I'm living for the world to see. Nobody but Jesus. So when we see this, we see the gospel greetings here at the end. Many times people finish reading the book, and they kind of glaze over because they're like, well, the, the end is kind of like the beginning. It's just a... It's a Grace sandwich. It starts with grace and peace and ends with peace and grace. But here's the deal. We need to grow in grace and peace. That's what Paul is telling them. That's what the Word of God is telling us today. So here, Paul has reached the end of his letter. He now reaches for encouragement in the gospel of grace and peace. Paul comes to Ephesus on his third missionary journey, there in Acts 19, and he asked, asked these believers, 
haven't you heard about Christ and the Holy Spirit? And they said, we've never heard of him. And so they received the Holy Spirit as he lays hands on them. He tells them of Christ, and he stays there for two years. Two years instructing them. And so there, he's not just preaching on his missionary journey, but as a missionary, he's telling them about grace. He's living out the truth of God's grace because once he was an enemy of the church and now he's a servant of grace. In fact, he desires to help them see how he's doing. So even though he's talking about Christ, he knows that they're concerned with how he's doing. And so he is dictating this letter and probably at this final greeting, he probably takes the pen himself and writes these final words, just as he did in Ephesus, I mean, in Ephesians, like we see, uh, Philippians, Colossians. He does it in the Corinthians. He, He wants them to know that the grace of the gospel is meeting him right there in the midst of his chains between two Roman soldiers. So every eight hours, he gets a fresh audience to tell them about the gospel of grace and peace. And so, here we are at the end of the epistle, but don't check out. Realize that this is essential for our every day. In in Ephesus, they they were often concerned about safety and personal protection, but as believers, they were more concerned about how Paul was doing. So while they were experiencing persecution there in Ephesus, Paul was in chains in Rome waiting to see the emperor Nero. And and, and what we end up seeing is that in our fallen world, our culture is hyper-focused on self-care and self-success, and many times we're not concerned about others, and we start focusing on ourselves. We need to see that the gospel greets us every morning and gives us God himself. And we have a new community here in the church. The church is vital to our very life. So so as we walk through these points, there's going to be three points. um, Think of this as the big idea that when the gospel greets us in Christ, it encourages your hearts, it brings you peace, and builds you into his grace. It encourages your hearts, it brings you peace, and builds you into his grace. So point one, the gospel greetings in Christ encourages your heart. See, this this greeting is very similar to Colossians 4, 7 through 9. And Paul is speaking to build the church up in the gospel, even as he preaches the gospel under arrest there in Rome. God's grace encourages your hearts regardless of the circumstances that you face today, tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, the next 10 years. And you know what? Into the next millions of years in eternity. See, Paul has reached, here's what John Stott says, he says, Paul has reached the end of his letter He is dictating, and perhaps at this point, he picks up his pen, as I said, he he authenticates his sentences with his own handwriting. And he certainly did this, most likely, because he did it in, as I said, Galatians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, and Colossians. He says this. This is probably his very greeting, his personal greeting. He knows that they're concerned about him. He has waited to the end of the letter, though, to talk about himself. He's not saying, this is, this is about me. He's saying, this is about Christ in me and what's happening. And so Christ here takes center stage. In fact, three times in four verses here, he speaks of the Lord, God, Father, Jesus Christ. And, and, and often today, like I said before, people can become so self-centered that we talk more about ourselves than we do about Christ. So how are we renewing our mind to the point where we bring out Christ because his grace now keeps building? It doesn't get less than, it gets more than every single moment of every day. What does he say in Philippians 2? He said, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort 
from his love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord in one of mine. So do, so do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. See, so let each of you not look on your own interests, but also to the interests of others, having this mind amongst yourself, which is your So how often we rush to tell of our own circumstances is telling of where our hearts are. The world seems to be winning here while Paul is in chains. The Ephesus is under attack. Today in our culture, how often do we get discouraged when we read news because we're looking at things from the wrong perspective? I remember in seminary, a group of Chinese house pastors came to a pastoral ministry class, and they were visiting there in New England, and we got a chance to hear through an interpreter what was going on in China. And about all the persecution, and, and just to let you know, it, it hasn't gotten better, it's gotten worse in the, in the recent years. But when we asked how we could pray, they didn't say, pray that we stop having persecution. They said, pray that we be bold to tell of Christ, even to those who are interrogating and torturing us. What a witness that is that they said the gospel is more than just being comfortable every day. The gospel is about boldly sharing it, even with those who are trying to persecute you. So, that's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, he says, remember Jesus Christ, he's risen from the dead, he's the offspring of David, and as Preached in my gospel, for I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. See, God's word can no, no more be chained than God himself can be chained. God's word is unbound. Even in persecution, in pestilence, whatever may come, God's word will continue to go forward as we speak it, as we share it, as we look for ways to tell others. And so he doesn't just send the letter, he sends Tychicus to communicate everything. He sends a person. Paul didn't just rely on the letter. He said he basically was sending a person to communicate, to tell the scope of God-given emotions that we all feel. Many times we need a person to communicate those things to another person. That's why God doesn't give us an airtight argument for his existence. He gives us himself. He steps into the world as a baby. Jesus comes to show us the Father's heart to give us himself. So, in fact, if you think about it, when the, he last saw the Ephesian elders and the Ephesians, there in Acts 20, he leaves as they pray in tears, knowing that they probably won't see him this side of eternity. And so, here we see the apostle fully entwined fully sharing his life with his dearly loved brothers. And he's sending another dear brother to communicate to the church what's going on, what God's doing. Think of how encouraged you are when you hear another believer t turn to you and tell you what God's doing in their lives, what God is talking to them about through his word, how God is working in and through the church. And so here, in Ephesians, we hear God's word saying to us that we are to be 
imitators, as dearly beloved children of God in Ephesians 5. Here's a dearly loved brother. Imagine 2,000 years from now, and someone says, oh, Tychicus, that was a dearly loved brother, a faithful minister of the Lord, in the Lord. Can you imagine that God's grace is working in you so deeply, so strongly, so richly, that it encourages others around you? We should be in prayer looking for ways that we encourage each other, that we build each other up into the gospel, realizing that the gospel, because it's true, changes every aspect of our lives. Yes, we live in a fallen world that's full of sin and corruption. There are many that fail, but we have a God of grace that keeps redeeming, rescuing, pulling us back. That's why Paul starts Ephesians 1 as saying, the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. God is the one who makes us faithful. If we were to rely on our own ability, we couldn't pluck up enough faithfulness to sustain us. But God's grace and peace keep encouraging us through his people, through his word, through his spirit. He keeps on and on bringing encouragement to us. So let's let's not miss this. We are called to proclaim and make Christ known. How are we showing that to others as God continues to speak? How does the love of Christ speak through your life? See, sending encouragement is not just sending a message, it's sending a person. Paul is strengthening his relationship here. He's sending encouragement to to put, the the word here in the Greek literally means to put fresh heart into them. It's such a privilege to have missionaries and other gospel churches that we support, right? And we want to encourage those who are on the field and those who are back home. We want to see God's grace continue to use instruments, human instruments, with his amazing word and his power and giftings. God is using fallible people to bring about amazing results through the gospel. And so so this will really, it really encourages us when we see that kind of cooperation, when we see other churches preaching the word, when we understand that gospel-centeredness means, at the heart of it, that we're finding hope in the grace of God. So it encourages our heart. It puts us into an understanding of seeing things in a right perspective. So, So let me ask you this. How often do you look at circumstances, and does fear and worry dominate your thoughts, or does your mighty God take a hold of those thoughts and say, I'm bigger than this. Give them to me. Don't be anxious. Don't lose heart. Entrust yourselves to the mighty Savior who works all things for our good and his glory. So how often do we tell others of how and what God is doing in your own life? I remember one person telling me once that God loves to surprise his bride the church, with good things, good gifts. And if he didn't hold back Christ, he's not going to hold back anything that you truly need, that you truly know that he is working and active, and he is good. He is all good, all powerful, all knowing. So Ephesians 3, 11 through 13 says, this was the account to the eternal purpose that he has re, uh, realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have a boldness and access and confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart for what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. In other words, Paul is saying, don't lose heart, don't be discouraged. This is for the glory of God, and it's for your glory too. Colossians 2 says something similar. These, these books were probably sent at the same time. It says, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of assurance, of understanding, and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is in Christ. See, in Christ, 
we have true encouragement to see what he's doing. It's almost like in the gospel, it pulls back the veil of eternity, and we see a little bit, a little glimpse in each other of what God's doing. And we get encouraged because we say, you haven't seen anything yet. One day, one day, the veil's coming all off. One day we will see as God has intended. So, so here, John, John Stott writes, here's where the apostle's desire to forge stronger personal links between himself and these Asian Christians comes out. His exposition of God's new society is no mere theory of theology, for he and they are members of the very same body. So, they must deepen their fellowship with one another by praying for one another. And that's why you see in Paul break out into prayer in chapter 1 and chapter 3, and then requesting that their prayers for him in verse 19 and 20, he's asking them to participate in prayer for him. And then he doesn't stop there. He actually sends a messenger that they know and love to bring about an understanding of what's going on and how to pray more in wisdom. See, prayer, correspondence, correspondence and visits are all three major means of grace by which Christians and churches can enrich one another and so contribute to the building up of the whole body of Christ. So, not only is it encouragement when we have gospel greetings, point two, says gospel greetings in Christ bring your peace. They bring your, you peace. So, in the Hebrew, we, you might have heard shalom is the word for peace. In the Greek, a lot of the words, the word shalom gets injected into the Greek word for peace here. And so it's pregnant with meaning when we think about how it's not about just the cessation of, of hostilities. It's actually about wholeness and health. It's about God bringing about a partial future that one day will be fully seen when Christ comes back, when we see face-to-face -face our Savior. C.S. Lewis wrote, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself, because there is not, it's not there. There is no such thing. In other words, happiness and peace that the world is looking for in all the wrong places, in reality, there's only one place to get it, and that's through Christ. God himself gives us that peace. And so peace to the brothers, he says, and it doesn't exclude the sisters there, just to let the ladies in the audience here know. The brothers there is the brotherhood, the, the whole church. So while the word was often used in greetings and in departings, Paul is using this in a gospel way for the wholeness and peace that's found only in Christ. Because we were predestined to be adopted by God himself. God didn't make a, a mistake. He looked down before the world was even created, and he said, I love you, I'm going to die for you, I'm going to call you to myself. Isn't that good news when you think about it? It's not like your circumstances, it's not like, I've had a bad day, so God must not love me. I had a good day, God must love me. I mean, that would be a yo-yo roller coaster effect of a, of a life. But if you know that God loves you because he didn't stutter, he said, you're mine. In Christ, you're mine. So, we trust Christ's atoning work. Only through Christ do we have salvation. If you haven't put your faith and trust in Christ, don't leave here without talking to someone, asking for prayer. Because Christ himself is our peace. Ephesians 1 actually goes into the depth. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. See, peace and love with faith is the aspect of faith in Christ. Some people act as if they can talk or argue people into God's peace, but that's not the case. We can't manufacture it. We can't escalate it on our own. We can't even stop wars from happening, right? We keep trying, we need peace that only comes from God through the cross. We need peace that only is found in Christ himself. John 16, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have 
peace. Now, what do we have in the world? He says, in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In other words, the peace from God is able to overcome circumstances and challenges and failures. He is, over, over, he is able to redeem and work all these things for his glory and your good. So trust him. Lean into him. Trust that the peace that comes from God is not going to fail. Isaiah 53 says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. His peace is a lasting peace. The world's peace will not last. It will always fail. It will always fail because it's not true peace. See, Paul is described here as the one, he says, Christ alone brings the peace. In Jesus, in Christ, Ephesians 2, 13 through 18, he says, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ, for he himself is our peace. He makes peace with us, and he came and preached peace to those who are far off and peace to, to those who are near. So if you feel far off today, lean into God's peace. Believe that God loves and it's called, trust him, turn in faith, turn from sin and trust Christ. Sin will never give peace. You ever wonder why Satan writes his promises, false promises, in bold print, but he doesn't tell you all the other lies behind it? But God, he consistently whispers his promises through his word. He speaks to him through other believers, and he shouts them. He shouts them through his promises in Scripture. We know that God is a God who loves to bring good gifts to his children. He didn't hold back Jesus. He's not going to hold back his peace that passes all understanding. So when Christians aren't reconciled and they are at war with other Christians and there's not peace with one another, it's very truth of the gospel that's at stake. To the gospel witness to the world needs to be that Christ is our peace, that the gospel is what we focus on, that we rally around, that we love to tell the good news. Isaiah 53, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet who bring what? Good news. Who publish peace. Who bring good news of happiness. Who publishes salvation. Who says to Zion, your God reigns. See, if God reigns, then sin can't reign. We need to turn and trust Christ. We need to turn and realize that as long as you hold on to sin, just reading John Flavel this week, he said, as long as you hold on to sin, you can't hold on to Christ. Once you let go of sin, you have more than enough in Christ. Sin will always destroy. It always lies. It always produces war and dissension. So peace and love with faith comes through this gospel, but Paul is praying this, that they would increase. It would, it would show up in ways that are significant in their lives. Not that they don't have it, because in Christ you have peace and grace, but it, it would grow. It would go from a seed of peace and grace into a strong and vibrant tree that's founded and rooted in Christ. So point three, the gospel greeting in Christ builds you into his grace. See, grace comes from one fountain and shows up in many streams, but it's all from Christ. Paul makes this clear. One thing in, in, the, in the Bible must be clear that grace is not about earning or meriting it. Romans 11, 6 says, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would be no longer grace. So God gives grace because that's what we need. There's no way around it. Uh, Bonar, Horatius Bonar says, Thy love to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to thee, can rid me of this dark unrest and set my spirit free. God loved us first. He loved us first. Listen to the, the words of Casting Crowns. Not because of who I am, 
but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, because, but because of who you are. You see, grace is all about, from beginning to end, it's unconditional, it's from God, and it's not universal. It's not to everyone. It's to all those who turn to trust Jesus, who believe on Christ. I love the, I love the story in the Chronicles of Narnia where Jill, it's the silver chair, she comes to this stream. In Aslan, this is the first time she sees this massive lion on the other side that represents Christ in, in C.S. Lewis's book there. Lion, uh, the lion Aslan says, are you not thirsty? She says, I'm dying of thirst. Then drink, said the lion. Uh, May I? Uh, could I? Uh, would you not mind just going away while I do it? Said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. As Jill gazed at this, its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious, rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you, will you promise not to do anything to me if I come, said Jill? I will make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, she said? I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It, did, it didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I, I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill. Come another step nearer <clears throat> as she came. I, I, I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. That's the reality of grace. Grace doesn't come from anywhere else or from anyone else. It comes from the very spring of Christ himself. Christ is the spring of all grace. Grace comes from God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no grace apart from Christ. That's why all through this letter, Ephesians 1, he says, glorious grace is sourced and adopted in Christ. Christ adopts us, forgives us our sin through grace. Ephesians 2 says, saving grace comes only through Christ. Ephesians 3 says, serving grace comes to others through Christ, in them. Ephesians 4 says, all gifts from God come through his grace. And then and finally, in Ephesians 4.29, he says, speak grace to one another to build up the body. So grace upon grace is coming through the spring of Christ himself. Paul is saying that we need grace today just as much as we needed it when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We can't stand, we have no strength, unless the grace of God holds us up and brings us the strength to bear. See, all of it from start to the finish to the future is from God's grace. Grace that comes through Christ like a constant waterfall. When you go down to Letchworth, you see that waterfall continuing to come. There's future grace. We don't store it up. God gives it over and over and over again. So as we experience the grace of God, we give it to others. That's what we're called to do. We keep looking to Christ. We keep pointing to Christ. We need grace. Others need grace. There's no way around it. So we are called. In this, there, there is a condition of that grace. Those who are loving our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this is ongoing love. This is not one time. It's a continual loving Christ. It's not, I went to the altar, I loved him that day. But your love for Christ grows because he gives you the love to grow. That is the good news. So don't, don't think that you merit that by some condition. But it's all grace from start to finish that the love of God is building in your life. Think of it this way. He produces love, grace, faith, and peace. And where do you see that? In the fruit of the Spirit. So even though the Spirit is not specifically mentioned in this exact passage, the Spirit is pointing back to Christ and the Father. That's what he does. And that's what he calls us to do in our lives, is point to Christ in all that we do. Listen to Ephesians 2 again. But God, being rich in mercy because of his 
Small love? No, his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, seated him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that the coming ages he might show his immeasurable riches of grace in the kindness towards us to the coming ages. That he might show us, I'm sorry, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Is this our own doing? No. Not of your own doing. This is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. See, at the end of all things, when we get to heaven, we are going to be trophies of the grace of God. He reached down, interrupted our way to hell, built Christ in us, gave us a new heart, and saved us. He rescued us from hell. That is amazing good news. Martin Luther states these two terms, grace and peace, constitute Christianity. Grace involves the remission of sin, peace, and a happy conscience. Sin is not canceled by lawful uh, living. No one is able to live up to the law. The law just reveals our guilt, fills the conscience with terror, drives men to despair, much less is sin taken away by man inventing endeavors. The fact is, the more a person seeks credit for himself by his own efforts, the deeper he goes into that debt. Nothing can take away sin except the grace of God. In actual living, however, it is not so easy to persuade people that it's by grace alone. There's opposition by all other means that they can obtain forgiveness of their sins by some other work. But it's only by the grace of God and the work of Christ. The grace of God is what won't stop, won't give in, continues. And that's why he ends with these words, with love that is indestructible. Indestructible love. Think about that. I think we call, in, in the ESV it says incorruptible, but it's this word in the 1 Corinthians 15, which is called the resurrection passage, right? Where he says, so is with the resurrection from the dead, what is sown and perishable is raised is imperishable. It's that word imperishable. All throughout there, we see that God's incorruptible, indestructible, imperishable life and love are constantly flowing to us through Christ himself. Through Christ himself in the resurrection, if Christ is not raised, we might as well pack it up and go home, people. The reality is that Christ is raised. That's why we're here today. That's why we love and worship Christ. That's why we sing, as the early Romans were scratched their head, they said, these Christians sing to a dead God. The reality is that he isn't dead. He's living today. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting, right? That's the truth of the gospel. He has abolished, he has destroyed death and sin. And one day, it will be complete in our lives. See, the epistle, uh, John Stott writes, the epistle which opened up with a bold glance into the eternal past closes with an outlook of an immortal hope in Christ himself that's secure and indestructible in the future. That's the good news. The good news doesn't stop at Christ died for my sins. The good news goes on to say he, went to, he took death and sin to the mat, went through the tomb, came out the tomb, and now he's alive and reigning, and one day he's coming back. That is the good news of the gospel. That is what we need every single day. Tim Keller writes, the gospel of grace is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Is that not good news to everyone who has believed in Christ? In Christ, there is so much hope. So may we never tire of viewing the gospel of grace at the cross of Christ, that God would grow us in his peace and grace, that he would, we would make much of our Savior. As the old hymn says, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of glory died, my riches gain I count as loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Let's pray. God, would you build more grace and peace and encourage your church today? 
Would you help us to see that the cross speaks the final victory over sin and death, and that only true peace is found in you, found in Christ himself. Holy Spirit, build us up in that grace and peace. And may we pass it on as an ever-flowing waterfall to those around us and tell them there's only one place to find satisfaction for your thirst, and that's in Jesus himself. Thank you that you are so good to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand together as we sing our doxology. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. As you go, may the gospel of grace and the peace of God which passes all understanding encourage and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. From the Father, through the Spirit, to you now. God be praised. Amen.